Non-sexy cat costumes do not exist in women's sizes. So I am wearing like a boy's size age 12 cat costume, which means my uh, my paws are very small. They're they're like Donald Trump's. And, uh, and my arms too, they won't disassociate. So <laughs> So, so we're here in our non-sexy cat costumes. We just wanted to thank all of you, and in many ways this is the long overdue party. I know some of you have been with us since the original Kickstarter and the original book, you know, January 2015, which seems like a more innocent world now. But um, this is the, the long overdue party we've been wanting to have. So thank you for letting us in this experiment work with Kickstarter, with The Strand, with this idea of kind of crowdfunding and bringing publishing to to a you know community level and to a locally sourced level, we love that. Um, and I think I'm going to invite Peter to get Mimi Gold Sparkle now. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go and see if I can find Mimi and bring her out because um, I'm sure she's going to be excited to see you all. Um, she doesn't. <laughs> She doesn't really like to make public appearances, so unless she's like really choosing, so you know it's a bit iffy. We'll see what happens. She's also a cutter. Mimi has been self mutilating for years now, so the public appearance, the body image stuff is tough. <laughs> They all think they're getting a cat. Um, all right, so quick introduction while Peter prepares. Um, the round face of all black cats are not alike. Mimi Gold Sparkle was born somewhere near Hudson, New York, circa 2005. Wrong. <laughs> she likes Trump jokes. Um, Gold Sparkle rose to fame after landing the lead in the short film, The Pop Star, for the Mod Cat Litter Box, which some of you in this room, Kristen Miller, had a big part in. Yeah, hi, Kristen. <laughs> she currently lives in downtown Manhattan, where she has two people, Amy Goldwasser and Peter Urkel, AKA Studio Gold Sparkle. Where, by the way, when we brought her home, she had diarrhea all over our home for about the first three weeks. And about the last two days of that, we left her with a house sitter at Christmas. So, who's not in this room now? <laughs> um, Peter, do you, do you think they're ready for you yet? Hold on. Uh, yeah, come on, Mimi, come on up. And she lives there today without the diarrhea and avoids an angry, stripey velociraptor of a cat. May, May Day, maybe will return her gold sparkle. In a rare public appearance, the performer to her author and advocate for the all black cat, note singular, joins us today to answer your questions. Please respect her privacy. No questions about Grumpy Cat. Mimi wishes her and her family well. So here's how we're going to do this. We are going to... Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. You all look so pretty. Hi. Peter's been method acting for a week. It's getting really old. I don't know what you're talking about. I am Mimi Goldfacker. So we, <laughs> he does this while we work, we share an office. Um, so here's the way the, uh, the press conference is going to work, as we hope is not a sign of times to come. The questions are preordained, and if anyone wants to ask them, we're counting on a lot of journalists in this room too. Uh, we will bring you the question and a pair of cat ears. <laughs> Yes? Okay. The questions will go in order, so. Anyone? Hi, Mimi. Hello. The caller was when Mimi would run away about once a week, and there was a time we found that she'd been living with our neighbor downstairs for like four days. We, it's such a New York story. We went to the deli with the Lost Cat poster that Peter drew, and would pull out like once a week. And we were at the deli asking them to post the lost cat picture again. 
and our downstairs neighbor was there, and he was like, hey, your cat's been with me for four days. I'm buying her food. It was a vacation. <laughs> so, so that was me, and you know, to this day, he thinks we were cruel to her. All right, are you ready for questions? I suppose so. All right. <laughs> okay, who has question number one? Michael. Hi, Michael. Hello, Michael. I have a question for Mimi. Question for Mimi. Who would play you in the film of your life? <laughs> That's a difficult one, Michael. But you're very handsome. Attracting that question. <laughs> Michael is a poor journalist. <laughs> Mimi, do you have the answer to that? Yeah, yes. Um, Alan Cumming or Idris Elba? <laughs> Good answer. All right, who has question one again? Yes, Sid, right? Sid is also with Kickstarter. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And Nipples. <laughs> okay, who has question number two? Maria, a, a real journalist. <laughs> Hello, Maria. Hard hitting question. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? I cannot seem to gain weight. <laughs> Mimi. <laughs> you got hisses, Mimi. <laughs> well, meh. All right. Question three? Yes. What is the trait you most deplore in others? Sneezing. What was that? Sneezing. Sneezing. <laughs> the two. Mimi oh. hates sneezing. Um, question four. Uh, Mimi, uh, what is the worst thing anyone said to you? Oh, um, you look just like my name of other black cat here. <laughs> <laughs> Question five. All right. In the cat hat. Hi, Mimi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, gentlemen. What is your most treasured possession? All of Amy and Peter's pin numbers. <laughs> ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. All right, question seven. All right, Nico. What is your guiltiest pleasure? <laughs> Tinder. <laughs> Nico has a cat very unlike Mimi. Nico has a doll of a cat named Lily. Mimi's less of a doll. Sorry. Mimi sits there and she does nothing, or she's usually outside, but when she's inside, she just. Just. <laughs> she also reads books. Uh, question eight. Yes. When did you last cry and why? Oh, when Joan Rivers died. <laughs> She likes fashion police. Uh, question nine. Hello. Oh, excellent. Who would you most likely to say sorry and why? Good question. To Hello Kitty. She knows why. <laughs> Google it, guys. Uh, question ten. Another jerk. What or who is the greatest love of your life? Corners. <laughs> she likes corners. <laughs> Follow up? <laughs> All corners. Yeah. Um, question 11. Lars? Mimi, what does love feel like? Corners. <laughs> Small brain. Fine. Was that wrong, 11? Wrong. Question 12. Tia. Not a journalist, children covering your ears. How often, Mimi, do you have sex? Oh, dear. Have you ever seen a cat penis? 
<laughs> That's not the question. That's all I can say. <laughs> she is a journalist. <laughs> yes? What was it like to cross that personal dash professional line to both live and work with Peter and Amy? Dinner was late. <laughs> what are we on? 14? 14 is a double, I believe. What was the most challenging moment in the making of this book? Hell no. For a brief stretch there, it seemed my collaborators were entertaining the idea of including 49 other ABCs in the book. Other ABCs? We had a good laugh over that one. <laughs> and your favorite part? May hates it. Oh. <laughs> May does hate the book. Okay, last question, 15. Oh, goody, I'm getting tired. And it's political. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Mimi, if you could edit your past, what would you change? The 2000 presidential election. <laughs> Thank you, Mimi. <laughs> we didn't have enough time to rehearse, basically because Peter's voice was just bugging me in the house. <laughs> Stop insulting me. Oh, sorry. All right, so we are going to move on. There are a lot of cats in the book representing here tonight, including people who flew in to be here, which is really, really exciting. Um, I, I might, let me know if I miss someone. I have a lot of cats in my head these past couple of years. Um, in the house, representing our master, Lucky, Princess of Long Island, Fergus, Coco, Sunny, Mimi, Salem the Younger, Ronaldo slash Widget, um, Kim the Count, Alfie, Ringo, Yoshi, Harold, Fester, Fig, Panth, and Vano, as well as Foxy Fred and Sylvia. See, I know this by, I know their genders too. Like, quiz me, it's crazy. I know who's alive and who's not, and I know who's a she and who's a he. Um, Foxy Fred, Sylvia, Minnie Pearl, Peepers, did I forget any all black cats in the room? I must have, come on. I'm scaring myself. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're gonna walk through and give the, the all black cats humans a chance to read their profile in the book, only if you want to. If you don't, just say a quick pass and we move on. You should all have books in front of you if you want to read, or if you want to read along. We're putting the cats up on the screen. And just um, a very quick in memoriam note, because it wouldn't be an Oscars without this. We just found out that friends of ours are not here tonight. It, don't worry, it's about a cat, not a person. But um, they're not here tonight because they had to put their lovely cat, Wee Beastie, to sleep yesterday. And they're, yeah, and they're friends of Master, the All Black Cat, we're gonna hear from first. We'll give you page numbers. Um, so we're really sad they're not here and we completely understand the loss. Also, his people are Angus and Julie and Angus happens to be from New Zealand and manages, longtime manager of the band Kiss. So we were really committed to making him read ACDC, one of the cats. <laughs> 
Australia tonight, which we thought would really bug him. But, but sadly, they're home. So to we be Steve, who is not an all was not an all black hat, but we still love her. All right. So we're gonna quickly go through the readings. Um, Masters the first on page eighteen. If Lars or Irene wants to read, please do, or let us know and we'll read. Um, so Master is a sleeper agent. Um, like the Russians say, you don't choose the cat, the cat chooses you. Lars and Irene named their gusty wee thing for the walking, talking, tram riding devil's associate cat in Bulgarkov's The Master and Margarita. It's not entirely true, it's named after the book, the actual tram cat was, was called Bergamot. Wrong. Uh, yeah, wrong. <laughs> so sad. Berg Bergamot was uh, the name, and that in Russian means the hippopotamus, so he was a big cat. Um, when they brought him home a few years ago, he fired out of the box, puked, put his tail in the air, and decided that this would do. He thinks it's extremely rude when guests don't say hello to him, and he spends his weekdays in Long Island City in Queens, where he's agreed to use our toilet, uh, and on his weekends, he uh, spends it in the country by a lake, and he's no good in a canoe. <laughs> right. We're going to do a quick jump out of order, just timing-wise, because we have a special request to read Knox back there, who is on, where's Knox? You don't have to skip ahead, Peter. Okay. 32. 32. Page numbers I haven't memorized. There's a bud joke. There's a bud joke. Hi, everyone. Um, my five-year-old daughter, this is her first adult. There she is. One wave over to everyone. And, and, and this is her favorite book. I do have to take out all the swear words. No, that's okay. But um, she asked if I would read Knox tonight, and then I have to take her home because she's kindergarten in the morning, so thank you for letting me do this. Knox takes no poop. Sure. Delightful weirdo, Knox makes people look at her butt. <laughs> Every uh, time, every time. She, she sleeps in Kyle's beard and steals things, jewelry, grilled chicken, knitting, and sewing tools that are often found buried in the litter box. The tiny two-year-old Mauser plays with humans, Kira and Kyle, dogs, Buster and Ripley, cat, fat lumen, and dead things in a 75-year-old house in the heart of Indiana. She is a risk taker, trying to jump into a hot oven, hanging out in the dishwasher, crawling into walls. When Kira found her dirty and hungry under a faded late blue 80s Aerostar minivan that was leaking oil, Knox yelled at her until Kira did what she wanted. Nothing has changed since. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Thanks for your love. Uh... This is the point. This book, crazily enough, is non-fiction as much as it can be when it's about cats. And we really like to think it's about people as much or more as it is about cats and just the, the characters we project on them. Uh, Lucky's people, are you interested in reading Lucky? Or Okay. We'll pass. Show us Lucky. There's Lucky. Okay. What about Princess of Long Island? We Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Princess of Long Island fishes for compliments. When the house is nice and dark and everyone is in bed, people, Paul, Patrice, Brian, Matthew, Christine, Colleen, blonde brother cat Maxwell, and lab retriever Mick Sadie. Princess likes to take the dish towel that hangs on the stove to another room and howl and howl until someone tells her she's a good girl. <laughs> she and Maxwell were to live there for a week as kittens on loan from rescuer Anne Irene. That turned into 13 years. Her fur is like velvet, but she's a little overweight. 
Princess looks like a raccoon from the back because she waddles. She's actually at the point now where we have to carry her onto the counter to give her treats. She can't jump on the counter anymore. And she'll cry until she gets her treats. And she gets them every time. Aww. Thank you. Princess of Long Island. Um, Susan, are you interested in reading? I signed you up for one that I thought would be good with your southernness. Church avoids eye contact, hunts lizards, and goes into a rigid trance while listening to doom metal on an old record player in a little seaside suburb of St. Petersburg, Florida, in a dark and off-the-street corner house that is... <laughs> my rhythm's a little off, I'm sorry. ...is decorated year-round in Halloween gore. He was named after the cat in Pet Cemetery. He has six toes on each of his front paws and tries to claim ancestry back to the days of Hemingway when polydactyl cats ruled Key West. Whoa. Thank you. We're so trying to get Stephen King to pay attention to church. <laughs> yeah, you can. All right, well, let's walk through the cats because our next cat is Fergus. Julie or Dan, where are you? So Julie and Dan are very special. Julie and Dan have four black cats in the book, and they showed up tonight with new black cat tattoos, and, and, and probably, like, like when people have a gambling problem, are not allowed to go near the ASPCA kittens. So yes, we'll get to the story count. Um, so yes, but the first of our black cats is uh, Fergus. Uh, Fergus talks shit. Chicago-born Fergus liked his water served in a pint glass, could carry on a conversation as long as you were willing, and loved almost everyone, exception an old boyfriend of mine. He lived to a Booker T in the MG soundtrack and to the chatty old age of 17. In 1992, when I was 17, I had to lie about my age to adopt him. Fergus was one of three ABC kittens at the shelter. One was lying down, one was standing up, and the future Fergus was sitting on top of the one, was standing on top of the one lying down. <laughs> yes, and he is one of four. Uh, we also have uh, Alfie, Harold, and the Count. Thank you. Where did she lay? Where did she go? Oh! I knew you were around here. <laughs> Would you be interested in reading Penelope Kitten? Zule came in from Miami for Thanks, this. So. Also, Zule, very, very special. Zule, I'm gonna embarrass her now because she's like, I was a child then. <laughs> Zule was one of the teenagers in a book of essays I edited written by teenage girls in 2007, and now she is even more amazing, and, and an adult professional who travels to book parties, and here she is. Penelope Kitten is on duty. Penelope Kitten lives in Los Angeles. Of course she does. She is technically no longer a kitten, but does not advertise this. And anyway, she's still the youngest, the spoiled little sister to cats Marcy, Hamlet, and Scooter. Penelope Kitten loves Hamlet. She does not care for Marcy. She does not meow. She plays police officer, a by-the-book kind of cop who takes a lot of lunch breaks. She patrols the perimeter and hallways of the house and lets Cynthia Matz and Freddie J. Nagger know in her squeaky voice if anything is amiss. When the offender is a cat, she will not hesitate to wrap him or her on the head. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Don, do you want to read Coco or you want us to? All right. Also, Don, Don's mother actually is the reason that the entire first motivation for this book, when we sent our, our annual holiday card out and Peter illustrates us and the cats, Don's mother looked at Mimi, our cat, on the card and said, why did they put Coco on their holiday card? <laughs> She's fiercely territorial like that. So here's, here's Coco. Coco was hot. Coco lived in the greater Los Angeles area where her urn is now in the wine rack. She met her man Steve in the mean suburbs of San Diego, sauntered up, locked her big eyes on him. Then for the, next, then for the rest of her 17 years, 
resented anyone who got too close to him, including his girlfriend, fiance, wife, Dawn, me. <laughs> I acknowledge that I submitted a late 90s photo when Coco had gained her freshman 15 as portraiture reference. Coco liked tuna and she liked to sing, especially on top of Old Smokey. She did the call and response. <laughs> Thank you, Dawn. Hey, Kat. By the way, anyone in this room named Kat or Kit got cat ears? <laughs> it was the big donors, and if your name had, had Kat or Kit. Um, so here's one of our cats, about her cat, one of the Salems. There are two Salems in the book, and this is Salem the Younger on page 48, if you're following. Sleek two-year-old Salem, who plays with bottle caps, lives with Cat, Cat, and her fiance Mike in the financial district of Manhattan, where he will always drink out of your glass, never his bowl. He's likely right now stranded on top of a giant mirror in the living room. Thank you. All right, Rebecca, did I? All right, Rebecca, I didn't realize that was you. So nice to meet you. Okay, this is really sweet. There are three cats in the book from Meow Parlor who were still at the cat cafe that works with Kitty Kun awaiting adoption when we started the book. And Emily Harahead connected us with them. So Rebecca adopted, also, by the way, Stephen Miliotti in the front row here was very, very special and sponsored these three cats who, so, so when people adopted them, they came with the book, <laughs> for better or for worse. So Rebecca adopted Ronaldo, who is famously the cat with his eyes closed in the book, we fought for that, who is now called Widget. So forgive us for doing the, the original name. Uh, Ronaldo wins. When stretched out, Ronaldo is almost three feet long. In a feat of expert level cuteness, one day in April, the 13 and a half pound, now 16, uh, three year old big boy <laughs> rubbed up against Rebecca, E, and flopped on his back at Meow Parlor, Manhattan's first cat cafe. Now a Brooklynite, adopted with his black and white friend Roger, who's now Poppet. He winningly fixes his slightly cross-eyed stare on Rebecca to try and wake her up before he resorts to sniffing her eyeballs. It's kind of gross. Uh, patience is his weapon, the ultimate ninja cat. He can wait quietly forever for a human to trip over him and drop food. Or, when his younger brother is bugging him, Renato will just sit and sit on Roger's head. He totally wins. Every time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Steven, do you want to read Kim? Foster. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Kim is in the bath. Oh, this is so timely, Kardashian. Not being Kardashian fans, Sarah and Francis dropped Kim's last name when they adopted her this winter, along with orange tabby foster maid Chris, after Valentine's Day date at Meow Parlor. They live in Queens, where Kim blends in perfectly with the furry black blanket draped over a recliner. She near disappears, unlike a Kardashian. She's obsessed with a bathtub, walking along the ledge, lying down in it when it's still wet, and using it as a kill corner to bring toys she's caught and will growl to protect. The one time she fell into a full tub, she hopped back out and shook herself off. No drama, no selfie. Aww. Yay. Aww. It, it's so sweet, too, in the way we've gotten involved with everyone's lives. Sarah and Francis, who adopted Kim, they're not here tonight because they just got back from their honeymoon today. So they met at Meow Parlor, they adopted Kim at Meow Parlor on a Valentine's date and they just got married. It's very Aww. cute, right? <laughs> Kim Kardashian, the great love story. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're gonna ask Julie and Dan to do a Sophie's Choice and pick one other of their cats. We'll do the count. Hmm? The count? Okay, perfect, he's next. Page 60. The, card is, the Count is hardcore. An attacker of vegetables and pencils, the Count fights everything. He is one of three incoming ABCs with Alpine Herald, adopted by Julian Dan in Washington, D.C. He hates rules. His song is Search and Destroy by Amy of the Stooges. 
He is a survivor. He has one kidney, one very large kidney. He has broken his hip joints, sliced open his paw, eaten a bicycle tire cap, a tire bell cap, which was my fault, and was given an overdose of sedative that put him in a 24-hour coma, defying surgery, stitches, anesthesiologists, and neurologists to keep bouncing back to his charmingly destructive self. <laughs> So on to Yoshi on page 88. This is very sweet too. This is Yoshi's human's brother. <laughs> it's a really nice gift for a sister, isn't it? Well, I, I do have to explain. It's kind of like take out the garbage. Uh, so I wasn't really planning on coming, but subliminally. <laughs> but, so Yoshi wants him. Despite the Japanese boy name, Yoshi is a 13-year-old girl. She was a stray who won the hearts of her cat-speaking people by jumping the highest of her litter meets, five, six feet straight on. She was a champ dealing with the two little humans who later joined her household. She currently lives and uses her words with an impressive vocabulary in the Bukola suburbs outside New York City. In an ideal scenario, she's landing, lounging on the warm floor of the upstairs bathroom eating shrimp. <laughs> We didn't get to the picture in time, I'm sorry. Uh, Patrick, are you interested in reading Fester or Fig? Or cool? Yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah. I'll do it. I'll go. Page 102 and 104. These are two Irish cats in the book. <laughs> Fester first came in contact with the Colin Sheehan household by accident. He was the outline of a cat quite flat on the road, with the exception of a long black pail straight up. This is 11.30 on an intensely hot night in Derry, Northern Ireland, a rare occasion. After chasing him with her car, when she, weeping, went to lift what appeared to be a poor dead creature to the side of the road, suddenly the head turned around, exorcist style, opened its large blue-green eyes and spat and hissed repeatedly. Tracy took him home to Donegal. For the next six weeks of cage care, the cat clearly held a grudge, hence the name Fester. <laughs> People would drop by to watch him spit and snarl and jump the cage across the room like a wild beast. Fester remained angry to a lesser extent for a decade. <laughs> he is now king of all cats, including the three all black cats, Mighty Moy, Irish for Good Morning, Puddles, found as a kitten floating down the street in a flood. Jewel slippers, who eats jewelry and sleeps in slippers. <laughs> and one fluffy Persian he lives with, named OTT for Off the Table, who is usually on the side table. Thank you, Pedro. I just want to listen to Pedro Green. That's not at all literary. Um, all right, do you want to read Fig or not? It's up to you. Fig sees dead people. On a windy day, 11-month-old Fig loves to climb to the topmost branch of the tree in his garden and sway on the branch with the wind in his fur. This may or may not be related to his ghost spotting, which he does a lot of from the home base he shares with Teresa, Damien, and his all-black cat brother Miles in Derry, Northern Ireland. Fig hates the spirit world. Thank you once again, sir. Are we going to stop there? We have to end with one more. Okay, I can read Bono. Wait, wait, you know what we should do? Is Mark Elwood still here? Will you read one? Okay, we're going to give you Sunny. This is our previous black cat. This is our black cat who started it all. And we get really upset like because it. people look at Sunny in the book and they're like, that cat's not healthy, which is really offensive. <laughs> Sorry about this. Sunny was a lump. Total mellow dude and lover boy Sunny lived with the gold sparkles in the East Village of New York until, sadly, but very appropriately, Valentine's Day 2005, when he curled up on their bed and died young. I know, so sad, 11 years old. They liked to think it was a contentment. 
He was impressively happy and lazy and heavy and unskilled in the ways of chaos. He would fall off large, secure surfaces. He didn't clean himself much, so he was often mucky. Once he got his claws stuck in the spine of a dictionary, which he dragged around for quite a while until he fell asleep next to it. (laughs) Unbothered, but still attached. Peter to this day swears that one night at bedtime, Sonny looked right at him and said, slowly, deeply, all right. (laughs) True. (laughs) Beyond fur color, he had not a single thing in common with future chic and shiny size zero ABC heiress, Mimi Goldsparkle. (laughs) Thank you, Mark, for the (laughs) next.